GDLS Canada, an industry leader dedicated to supporting our customers and the community. Craig Moore. I'm 62. I was born uh, in November 1960 in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. And what communities did you live in when you were involved in lacrosse? Uh, I currently live in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Um, I uh, grew up in Sackville, New Brunswick, which was where you know, I was introduced to the game of lacrosse and where sort of my roots are and my introduction to the game. Uh, but then uh, between, I guess, New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, I played or coached uh, in Ottawa, in uh, Edmonton, and in Boston, uh, and in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts. When and how did you get involved in lacrosse? So, uh, growing up in Sackville in the 70s, um, uh, in a town that really, like, uh, you know, most of New Brunswick didn't have a, uh, a history of lacrosse, there had been uh, some people in the community who had kind of latched on to the introduction of the game over the previous 10 years uh, through Canada Games, uh, through our neighborly province in Nova Scotia. So there were uh, some minor programs in New Brunswick, including Sackville, uh, St. John, New Brunswick, Caraquette, uh, Fredericton, I think. And, uh, you know, we were introduced to the sport uh, at probably the age of 10 or 12, uh, probably just through the neighborhood and through older siblings who played the game. Can you share any details about your family as well as their involvement in lacrosse? So family-wise, I did have a, a one of two brothers who, who, as I mentioned, I kind of followed him into the into the sport in Sackville. Uh, David, who played for many years uh, with me in, in in several cases on, on different teams, and then as a dad, I've had uh, three kids who've all played lacrosse uh, here exclusively in Nova Scotia at different levels, and and uh, you know enjoyed the game as well. What type of work did you do outside of lacrosse? So my uh, career, and I'm semi-retired, I guess you'd say right now, but uh, has been in the event marketing and sports marketing business. Um, most of the years uh, here in, in Atlanta, Canada, uh, some years in uh, Toronto, but that's involved uh, running, uh, managing, staging, uh, you know, small and large uh, events and helping companies with their uh, sponsorship planning. Can you tell us about the organizations and positions you held in your lacrosse career? I guess it's uh, been a bit of the gamut. So certainly played the game for many years. Uh, I did a lot of coaching over the years and have played roles administratively as well. Sat on a number of boards, provincial and national, and uh, you know worn different hats like most people at the game do over, you know, 30 years or so of, uh, of participation. Can you tell us your most memorable moments in lacrosse as a player? You know, growing up in Sackville um, and at a stage where I, I mentioned we had, uh, I had an older sibling and, and a few friends of mine playing, uh, we were fortunate to get involved uh, with uh, some of the provincial programs uh, in the you know, the mid to late 70s, which uh, probably culminated with uh, a, good, a good memory, which was going to the Canada Games. So we had, a, uh, as I mentioned, the centers in New Brunswick where lacrosse had a, a solid base and had minor programs running. Um, in 77, uh, I participated with uh, a team which was made up of players from, a number from Sackville, uh, St. John, and I think a couple from Caraquette. So we participated in, in that Canada Games program. Um, and prior to that, actually, another part of that memory was actually, I call it barnstorming with uh, the provincial team from Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and Quebec. We all came together in advance of Canada Games to go to Newfoundland for 10 days, traveled around the province to a variety of centers, large and small, and put on exhibition games in a clinic for the local community. And this was all uh, one of the Canada Games initiatives to help promote and build and grow the sport in Newfoundland. So as a, I guess about a 16 year old, uh, you know, it was an eye opener for me to be part of that program, uh, to see, you know, play with, with guys at that level, at that age, 
Uh, but then it was also an eye opener to actually see one of the most beautiful provinces in, in our country, Newfoundland. And I, I always, I remember that uh, summer as one of great excitement around the competition of being part of Canada Games, representing New Brunswick. But I also remember, you know, just enjoying the province of Newfoundland uh, and, you know, how hospitable they were and what a great event they put on. But there was also part of that experience was as the, as the game was developing in New Brunswick, um, there were people like Bill McBain and, and other leaders, some of them were from outside the region, who happened to come through and, and put their stamp and encourage uh, the growth of the game, uh, which, which was significant for New Brunswick at the time. So you would say that Bill McBain's role was, was also kind of as a builder in that region? Uh, Bill McBain certainly is a national uh, person, you know, national uh, icon uh, in lacrosse, uh, had a, you know, a storied career obviously, but at that time, um, he, I think with his career in the military, he actually moved around the country and he was one of the best, I mean, he was the, he was the coach's coach. He was the, uh, among the, uh, the best in the country. And so I think it, he found himself uh, working, uh, I think for a year or two in Nova Scotia, and then he moved up to Chatham, New Brunswick. There's an Air Force base there, I think. And so wherever Bill went, he kind of, he was the, he was the leader in terms of trying to establish the game. Uh, and that had an impact on New Brunswick and that sort of triggered uh, a lot of people. And I was kind of one step away from Bill. My brother played for him when he was in, uh, in New Brunswick, but he, he encouraged a lot, of, uh, a lot of people to get into the game. Obviously when you were you know, nearing the end of your teen years, you, you moved to Ontario and began playing there. Was there a pretty big adjustment doing that? Yeah, so the, um, that, that, that was, a, 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 I guess, another highlight. So transitioning as a young guy in New Brunswick, where there wasn't really a, a great tradition of the game, recognizing that outside the province, you know, there was, you, you'd sort of know of British Columbia or Ontario where, you know, the, the, the best teams were. And I had a door open for me um, that, uh, you know, allowed me to go to uh, Ottawa and play uh, I think I was in my last year of high school, so I moved to Ottawa for the summer to play with the Ottawa Olympian Capitals, and that was a that was a big eye opener because you know every every game every 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 day you went to the rink you're playing a, a, obviously another higher level a, a quicker game better players more depth, and so uh, yeah that was an adjustment certainly the adjustment I think you know uh, as, you know better better skills better speed and um, that really helped me a lot although it was a bit scary. At that time, leaving the province, not really even knowing what I was getting myself into, but I had great people on the other end that uh, were open arms and helped me a lot uh, to kind of establish uh, myself with that junior program. Uh, so it, it was a big adjustment, but it, it worked out well. Were there any other junior experiences you had as a player uh, outside of Ottawa? Yeah, I would say probably uh, the, the other memorable one was um, playing in the Minto Cup. Um, so that would have been in 79, I believe. So we, uh, there was a, f a couple of us uh, on the Ottawa and Apian Capitals. Peter Much, who was, a, was, a, was a, a, our leader of our team in Ottawa, outstanding player. Uh, and Peter uh, and I uh, were, were given the opportunity to go out uh, to Edmonton in 79. And at that time, uh, Alberta had been granted uh, the opportunity to host the Minto Cup. Traditionally, of course, the Minto Cup being an event uh, uh, competed for in you know, recent decades by Ontario and BC for the Junior A Championship. Um, and I think there was an initiative uh, to, uh, I'm not sure why Ottawa or why um, Calgary was given the right to host, but they were. So uh, Alberta wanted to put together an all-star team essentially to to compete for the Minto Cup. And part of that process was gonna be built around the Enoch Tomahawks. Uh, Enoch Tomahawks, which is a First Nations community outside of Edmonton, uh, had stepped up and said, look, we're gonna, we're gonna put together a good team, all the best players from Edmonton, Calgary, you know, across the province, and we wanna, you know, we wanna uh, take a run at uh, the Minto. And that's where Peter and I uh, were invited to come out and play with Enoch and with uh, the, the Minto Cup team. So. Uh, that was a great experience. Again, you know, sort of competing at that level. Leading up to the Minto, we had some 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 good exhibitions back and forth with Burnaby. They come in from the West Coast, or you know, we have a few games just to kind of tune up. Um, and uh, that was that was a good experience. We um, we ended up 
I think in the Minto Cup itself, it was Burnaby that came, Burnaby Cable Vision, that came from uh, uh, BC and Peterborough from um, Ontario. So that was, uh, that was a great, great experience. How did that team do? We held our own. I think um, we, we, I think we split. So it was kind of a, 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 two, a two game round robin. We played each, each team, each of us t twice. So we split um, with, with Burnaby, with BC. I think Peterborough beat us both ties. Peterborough and, and uh, BC ended up in the, uh, uh, in the final. And I think BC won it that year. Uh, so we, you know, we held our own. We were disappointed, but we didn't get beyond. I guess probably going into it, we would certainly have been ranked third. But we were glad to get a one, and all the games were pretty competitive. And uh, you know, we just uh, we did we we didn't achieve our goal, but but it was still a good experience, and, and the team played well. A quick question on on the Enoch team: Were they completely first? Was it a First Nations team? No, it was it was uh, for the most part the relationship with Enoch was um, uh, the players already in. Edmonton, primarily, they had a um, South Edmonton association, they had a couple of associations in Edmonton. So the, the, a lot of the players from either of those teams came together to play on this Enoch team, and then a few few other of us. But what the the, the, the vision for Enoch, which was great, so they they agreed to um, have us come. They were you know well equipped, great facilities on on at Enoch, the rink there. Uh, they had a nice bus for us to travel around with. They were relatively, from what I can gather, a wealthier nation uh, or wealthier uh, community. And we taught their kids. So we set up a minor lacrosse program uh, and, and helped to coach the kids, introduce them to the game and, uh, and as part of you know, being, being, being uh, hosted by them. And uh, you know, they saw it as a, an important thing to bring you know, their game back to their kids. And so they saw it as a way to have them exposed to some young you know, junior players who would play their, their games uh, and, uh, and then coach their kids. So it was, it was a great, uh, great experience in that regard as well. Going, kind of taking a, a bit of a, a step here towards your time with Team USA, uh, can you tell us a bit about the background of that event as well as the process to select the team? And in 19, uh, sorry, 1980, um, the I guess the, well, it, was the, it was the inaugural World Box Lacrosse Championship um, taking place in BC and the venues were primarily in, in Vancouver and in Victoria and I think the the idea behind the event kind of was prompted out of uh, competitions a few years prior some, uh, it might have been the World Fields or another international event saying let's let's put a let's put a, a World Box Championship together and, and they, I think they got the pulse of what teams might be interested. Australia was interested, and they, they figured out there's, there's some, you know, we've got a good chance of putting on a, a, our first world championship. So at that time, I was still at West playing junior, and, uh, um, and I, at the same time, uh, I have dual citizenship. So I, I, I carried both passports and was, was able to... I could I could uh, work or live in in both countries, and I'd spent a bit of time in the states over the years, uh, um, you know, in the New England area, and I I actually had intended uh, between in in between seventy nine and eighty, I was I was planning on taking a year off university and working in uh, in New England, and this this uh, event was announced, and um, sort of. You know, uh, over a, f a few phone calls and a, a letter or two, I discovered that they, Team USA was actually holding tryouts uh, to select their team that would represent the U.S. team at the, at the Nationals. Um, the way the tournament was structured, there would be five teams, so there would be two Canadian teams, Canada East and Canada West. Canada West being the top senior A team in B.C. and Canada East being the top senior A team in uh, Ontario. So those teams would have been playing together regularly, you know, th through their, their senior A program. While the U.S. team was an all-star team, um, the First Nations team was effectively an all-star team too. They came together kind of just, I think, they knew who was on the roster, but they, I think they literally just that week kind of had their first get-together. And then Australia, who would have been, you know, uh, 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 an all-star team per se. The challenge with our group uh, in the U.S. was that you know, there wasn't a lot of box across in the U.S. It was all field. Um, you know, at that time, there would be certainly some box 
Canadian box players going and playing in the field, but down in the U.S. Uh, NCAA programs. But so the pool of guys that showed up to try out for the U.S. national team were like 90% field players. They they might have been in a box before, but they never really played the game. But they were excellent. They were top drawer field players. So all really good athletes. Uh, you know, you know they, they knew how to compete. They they had all the, the good qualities, and they'd achieved a lot in their own respects. So we had, you know, guys between the, probably the age of 20 to 30. Um, I was very much on the younger end of the team. Um, but most of these guys had finished their collegiate careers. They had All-American status, a lot of them. Um, and are, you know, some of them are their icons in their game today. Dom Starja, Brooks Sweet, a few, you know, top drawer, you know, international players. So, so these guys came together, and, uh, and was, the team was coached by Jim Logan, who formerly, just years before, had coached uh, the Boston, I think it's the Boston Bolts, whatever the, the pro team was in Boston. And so we held training camps for five different sessions in different universities uh, in the States, you know, West Point, and, you know, we went to Philly, we went, you know, Cornell, we went all over the East Coast, and we would hold weekend training camps. That's how we got together. And that, over those five sessions or five weekends, you know, you're taking field players and you're trying to get ready to go play against, you know, the top senior teams, um, box players. So, uh, but it was a great, a great experience. I mean, um, I was allowed to participate because I was a dual citizenship and I could, I could try out for the team. It was just uh, great to be part of. As a team, we, uh, we, had, we had a good, a decent tournament, obviously a huge learning curve. We had some control scrimmages, I think, with Oshawa. We played uh, a senior B All-Star team out in Vancouver just before we played our first game, which we actually we won that game, uh, beat the senior, a, senior B All-Star team. Um, but there was, you know, uh, we, we were learning every game. So, um, yeah, it was a great experience. How did that group of primarily field players adjust to playing the best box players in the world? Adjusting every game. You're learning every game, I think. Um, I guess answer it another way. There, there, there was first of all what, what did our guys bring. I think, I mean, as I said, they were all r really top drawer athletes. Like that was a that was a strength. We were a fairly big, uh, I'd say, big team, quick, uh, pretty physical, um, and we most guys could go both ways. You know, that was one thing that I think, uh, and, and and others could, I'm sure, but certainly all majority of the U.S. guys could play both sides, both hands. So that was a, a, actually a, a good thing that our competition had to adjust to. But, but everything in terms of adjustments, whether, um, you know, uh, the field game, for example, would be a, a lot of it's played on the perimeter, larger spaces, you know, uh, there's no 30 second, there's no shot clock. Uh, and there, you know, the, the, the ability to go to the middle, like that was a big thing that Game after game, guys would say, "Okay, well, I got to get the, you know, I, I, the, we, we've got to play this way." And as much as you ran, you, you, you know, through the the training program, we, you know, we tr covered a lot of stuff. But you know, in terms of game time, simulation, and what has to happen, that was certainly those things were were different. The lack of, you know, tighter confines in terms of the, how the game is played, where the field players weren't used to it. Um, the uh, just the the box itself, and and think of offense just. Um, you know, just shooting, for example, like these guys, the field players, because in their game, the nets are six by six. They were shooting from everywhere. Like they were shooting from what I would call, you know, like that was their instincts kicking in in some cases. So that would, that would be a little adjustment for them. Um, uh, and then even, even in the offensive end of the game, you know, how the box works too. Like in field, that game, obviously the offense a lot of times run from X behind the net. And, and so we actually had guys going behind the net. In some cases, like that was where they felt comfortable operating. So, so there was a lots of adjustments. Um, but I think they, we, we, I, I think we, we were fairly quick study. Our first game, we almost pulled off a big upset. We had a, a goalie who was playing exceptionally well, and we were playing Brooklyn, uh, Canada East, and we were up by a goal with 30 seconds left, and we were kind of this was real. We came out. It was an intense game, and we were. We were hungry, and um, they scored with probably, I don't know, 20 seconds left or not a lot of time left on the clock. And, and it was just, you know, it was a real letdown, of course. Then they went on to beat us by five in overtime. But that was our, our closest call to pulling off what would have been a, a pretty, pretty big upset. Wow.
So I guess the results were uh, we were eliminated. We, we won a game. We beat the Aussies, uh, lost the First Nations um, and on Ontario and BC. But uh, um, Coquitlam ended up beating, or Canada West ended up uh, beating um, the First Nations team in the final. And that was a hell of a game. Um, the only other differences I would say, uh, as I said, the two Canadian teams were club teams. They played together all the time. And um, ourselves and the First Nations team and Australia, we, were, we, we hadn't got like 50 games or 30 games or a number of games together to sort of kind of gel. We were kind of gelling at the tournament a little bit. That, that would have made a difference, I think, if we had a, had a season together, like playing, playing together, that would have been a big difference. And the other difference, which I didn't discover until probably at the tournament, Dwight Metke was an American citizen. And I ran into Dwight at the Worlds because he was moved out to play. He was our goalie in Edmonton. Dwight, Dwight was our goalie when we went to the Minto Cup. He was unbelievable, of course. He's, you know, Dwight's a Hall of Famer. Um, but Dwight was also a dual citizen. I had no idea. He came up to me at the Worlds and said, Craig, what are you, what are you doing here? So I, I explained the situation. And I was like, man, if we had had Metke, you know, I, I bet you we would have probably, as much as our goalie, John Yeager, was fantastic. He played, you know, beyond, he played way beyond himself, but, but that might have been a difference maker. And then Dwight, I think, in subsequent years, of course, he went on and he played for the U.S. national team in, I think, some of the worlds. I can't remember the details, but, but because he had the dual citizenship, so. What were your most memorable moments in lacrosse as a coach or as a builder? Coaching-wise, uh, I think the first, my intro, a good, a, a reasonable level intro, which was great, was uh, as a, uh, I was an assistant at um, Springfield College in Massachusetts in, I guess, the early 80s. Uh, I was doing a graduate program down there, and I was probably in my early to mid -20s, or mid-20s. And so uh, Springfield had a pretty good tradition. They were a Div three program. Um, uh, so back then it was Div One or Div Three. So Hopkins and Maryland and Virginia were all Div One, etc. We we were Div sort of Div Three, and uh, we actually we had a good squad. Um, and I I coached with Keith Bugby, who stayed at Springfield for probably f 40 more years. Um, but and Keith was a young coach. He was in his late twenties, and he asked me to come on and help work with the attack. Uh, and uh, as a graduate assistant, and I. <laughs> I didn't know anything about field much, but I, I sort of came on, came on and agreed to help where I could and, and certainly learned a lot with Keith about the field game. Um, but we actually, we did get over the few years there, we did get the NCAA championship uh, uh, tournament um, and uh, we lost to the eventual winners, Mount Washington. But that was, a, that was a great experience, again, in a different country, different sports system um, and the whole approach that was taken to coaching and the, the profession of coaching and the importance of coaching that you know the US puts on and is layered into their sports system and you can see it in any sport whether it's lacrosse or whatever there they they put a lot of resources into uh, that in the game so that was a good good eye opener um, and then I guess you know my time in Nova Scotia the last uh, 20 or so years um, a lot of the time I've spent has been coaching and that started with you know six-year-olds up to you know junior provincial teams and uh, um, and taking or being part of teams or in some cases head coaching or being on on the coaches uh, end of things to um, you know the big tournaments which would be you know Whitby Whitby was probably for our our minor programs Whitby was uh, the first step of of getting kids. Uh, from a provincial program back up to competing against kids at the national level. That was a great experience for everyone, especially our kids, just to be exposed to that and have their, you know, see, see what level the game could be played at. Um, but then I'd say probably the, the highlight was probably with the girls programs here in uh, Nova Scotia. Um, uh, t the, the girls box program kind of evolved and um, uh, Wayne Fink and uh, Julie his daughter, they were instrumental in establishing the first uh, uh, girls, I think it was a Pee Wee or Bantam program to compete when they allowed girls to play at the box nationals and they put that team together and I kind of came in <laughs> on their heels and, and got involved and, and helped them work and really have, have had a great uh, experience, um, you know, the, the years I spent with Wayne and Julie and coaching the, the girls and, you know, to the point now, obviously, after this amount of time, you see whether it's the girls or the guys, uh, 
I was involved with as a coach. You know, they're young. You know, they're they're in their twenties now, and they're they're moving on. And they've been given back now as coaches themselves. So that was pretty rewarding. Was there a team or two that sticks in your mind out of, out of all those years? Well, a couple. The first time we went up to Whitby with a bunch of young, keen kids, you know, Pee Wee Nationals, and that was exciting because no one really kind of knew what to expect. And I remember at the end of the tour, we went up there, and we, you know, I, I think we, we probably won a couple games, maybe, you know, uh, Quebec and maybe Manitoba or Saskatchewan. Of course, we, we took our lumps with Ontario and BC, and, you know, you get to the point where they're throwing the ball in the corner, you know, that kind of thing. But... But they were gracious about it. They were good about it for the most part. But I remember talking to one of my co-coaches and I said, you know the story about the bear going over the mountain to see what he could see? I said, well, this is kind of the feeling I'm getting here. We're, we're going to go over and see what we can see. And, and it, was, it was a great uh, introduction. Uh, and, and obviously the Whitby tournament for so many kids has been something they've looked forward to being part of. So that was, uh, that was certainly a highlight. And then the other one would probably be uh, we had a, a group here um, that secured the female nationals in 2014, so I would have been one of a group of people. And I, I coached one of the, the girls' teams in that. Um, the, I want to say it was the Bantam team. I think it was the Bantam team uh, with my son. Um, and um, that involved Pee Wee, Bantam, and for the first time, junior nationals. And again, with people like uh, Wayne Fink and Julie and Mike Hayes, and a, a great gang. We, we put on a successful tournament. I think everyone that attended thought it was first class, and, and, and our teams played well and, and represented the province. Okay. Any other highlights for lacrosse? Um, you know, been, been involved a fair number of committees in different roles administratively. Uh, you know, and, and frankly, I've, I've, I've enjoyed the coaching for the most part. That's where I, I like to spend my, my time. But the one thing that's been, I've, I've, uh, I've been happy to be part of and I've got a lot out of uh, and met some tremendous people would be uh, the Canadian Lacrosse Foundation. So um, I've been uh, on their board for 10 or 15 years and, and that, that group is responsible for kind of I guess uh, uh, promoting and uh, you know educating people about the history of the game, the importance of the history of the game and its roots, um, uh, and that's been a, a learning experience for me. Um, it's also a group that's responsible for helping to make sure that the you know the the financial strength of of the game of lacrosse in Canada is is maintained and there's you know and it, it, uh, that we're in good shape for those rainy days. Um, and the, but the people on the board uh, have been awesome to work with. Uh, Jim Burke, who's, who's been the chair, who's a, a Hall of Famer, and he's, been, he's led in every element of our, our, our game over his 50 or so years, I'm sure. Uh, it, you know, so there's certain people that I've been able to kind of uh, you know, contribute in a small way to the game through a, a committee like that or through a board like that. That's been a, that's been a pleasure. Um, and one of the, 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 one of the uh, fun things that I thought was, was, was good to be part of was a few years ago when um, <clears throat> the foundation was responsible for, um, uh, through guys like Jim Calder and, and Jim Burke, et cetera, um, putting on a weekend in Montreal to celebrate the 150th anniversary of uh, the modern rules of the game. So that point, 150 years, well, 155 now, but... 150 on the anniversary when uh, George De Beers, you know, he presented and and put more rules um, into the game, more structure into the game, uh, and we celebrated that in Montreal with a historical kind of authentic reenactment games uh, and some time with academics and you know icons of the game talking about their experiences or their research or whatever. So it was a real lacrosse intensive, great you know weekend to celebrate our our national our national game. So that, those are a couple highlights for sure. Yep. Who was the best player or players you ever played with or against? Um, there would probably be, be a couple guys come to mind. Uh, certainly, um, I mentioned Dwight Metke earlier. Dwight being our goalie in, uh, in Edmonton that year, he was fabulous. Just, you know, a great athlete, obviously, but just a great guy. Like, he loved... He just loved playing lacrosse. He, he had a sparkle in his eye every time he came to the rink. And, you know, we just knew Dwight was going to stop the ball. Like, he, he was so good. And, um, 
and uh, so that that was that was fun. I I haven't stayed in touch with uh, Dwight at all, but he was certainly one. Um, another would probably be, um, which would be someone I played against in junior, and then in the worlds was Barry Pallas, uh, and he played for St. Regis, uh, their junior team, junior B, when I was in Ottawa playing their with the Nepean Capitals. Uh, and that was when I, I remember the first time playing St. Regis, and I remember Barry, and he was just, I mean, they were a standout team anyway, but Barry was like head and, head and shoulders above everyone in, in junior, and then, then I, I, I just saw him on the roster a few years later at the Worlds, but he would certainly be, be obviously, he's a, um, a tremendous player. And then Brooks Sweet would be the other guy, Brooks with, with Team US. He was, a, he was a great player. He adapted very quickly to the box game. He was leader in the field, but... He was uh, one of our leaders in the box as well. So those would be the guys I'd say. Talk to me about key relationships you developed over the years in the game with individuals in this or other parts of Canada. And why were they important to you and how have they helped you? Probably the first would have been uh, my experience in Ottawa where I was, I was leaving New Brunswick. It was kind of, I, I didn't have anyone to lean on to talk about what to expect because it was a, I didn't, have, didn't know many people who had left to go play. Uh, whether it was lacrosse or hockey or anything at that age. And I was supported by my parents, but I was also supposed to be going to this team with a friend from, another playing friend from New Brunswick who backed out at the last minute. And so it was a bit of a aha moment. Um, I ended up going and when, part of being in Ottawa was being billeted and welcomed. And, and, and so I went right from the, air, from the train station with the guy who arranged this to the, an outdoor box and the first guy that came up and shook my hand was Peter Much. And I remember, like, like, this is the first guy I'm meeting, and he was the most friendly, welcoming guy. I just right away started to feel at ease. And then you're looking around, and you're checking out these guys, and immediately you're looking for skill level. You're, like, you're, you're trying to size up, okay, what am I getting myself into here? And, uh, and it was all good, and I ended up actually living with Peter for a few weeks. Uh, and they were great family. They were first family kind of in Ottawa at that time. His brother, Andy, and, and Peter, were, they led that team. And so Peter kind of, I think he kind of took me under his wing a little bit. We became very good friends through the summer. We were, we saw each other every day. We, you know, we, we had some good, great, you know, we competed and, and had, you know, some good battles we went through on the floor against some good teams. And so he really reassured me. He helped me. We stayed in touch, became good old friends. And he was a great player himself. So that would be, that was certainly Peter. The Finks, I think I mentioned earlier, Wayne Fink and Julie, kind of in Nova Scotia. Really, anyone who's been part of the game out here for decades have felt the influence or have looked up to that family for inspiration, leadership, and for getting involved with things. And, and uh, they, they made a big impact on, on, on me and my enjoyment and involvement with the game as they have uh, hundreds or you know, thousands of, of, of people. And you know, Julie, I think, in some ways, is, you know, she's continuing on that think tradition. And then... Uh, and then Jim Burke's been, I've, I've, I've looked up to Jim Burke, I thought he's been a great leader, we're, we're lucky to have him in the lacrosse community, and he's, right now, the role he has, he's kind of, certainly he's, 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 he's behind the scenes with the foundation, but he's doing a, a great job, and as he would have in all the other areas, so those would be, those would be three people that, that I, I kind of admire. What are the prospects looking like for the game in Atlantic Canada as well as... Um, I, I guess, you know, we're coming out of COVID, so that, that, that's affected a lot of things, a lot of sport. Um, you know, I know the MAs uh, across the country, you know, during the first year of COVID certainly suffered. And, um, and, and so there's, it's almost a stalling thing. I don't know how, exactly how numbers have been affected, but generally I'm optimistic. Um, I think, you know, the, the, on the broad, the broad uh, spectrum, you know, where the game is going, the growth internationally, where, you know, talk about five teams competing for a world championship in 1980 and, you know, 40 years later, there's, I don't know if there's, whether it's 80 or 90 or what the number is now, nations that have a program that are, so the game is going internationally. It's, 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 it's on, a, on a rise. So that's, that's good news uh, that, you know, you're, you're optimistic for, the, for, the, for that reason. Um, in our province, I'm optimistic for a couple of reasons as well. Um, our province is growing. Um, we have aggressive, uh, you know, um, targets for immigration, for growth. Um, we're now in the last 
five to seven years, we've been way more successful at keeping young people here who traditionally would have to leave to go find employment, maybe ending up not here. So our population, I think, over, over the next 10 or 15 years is going to start to get younger, and we need that. And with younger people, greater population, more families, more kids, I think, you know, so the demographics, in my mind, just, you know, on a, on a cocktail napkin says we're, we're, that's a good direction to go in. Um, but I think, um, you know, we've got a bit of a foundation, although we don't have, we never really had that cultural kind of fabric of the game, like in Ontario or BC. But there's these people that, like a Wayne Fink, you know, or Steve Brown, or the other leaders in Nova Scotia who've built that foundation that we can, we can capitalize on now. And now, now we have the Thunderbirds. We have, you know, like one of the most successful NLL franchises in recent history has come to town. And that's going to, there's no question that that's going to spike things. I think that's, that's a, great, a great thing for the province and for Halifax. Um, and I, I thought about this the other day about other parallels where, that, that relate to Nova Scotia. In 1990, uh, I think it was 1996, the first major junior hockey franchise came to Atlantic Canada. 1996. And up until that point, you know, if kids even had the interest to play at a higher level, they'd, they'd have to leave. And, you know, it, 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 it was a different kind of environment. 2004, eight years later, Sidney Crosby was drafted into the queue. And 1996 to now, so we're talking 30 years. So 30 years later, three of the top 10 point getters in the NHL last year were from Nova Scotia. All of them actually from, from HRM. So I think the major junior hockey, again, can't really apples to apples. We, we do have a hockey fabric, you know, here. But I think with the Thunderbirds, I think you're going to allow kids to see the game played at the various highest level, some of the best guys in the world. And it's, it's unbelievable product. I mean, just, it's just, you're seeing people go through the gates at the, at the Scotia Bank Arena and who've never seen a game before. And they are on their feet. They're coming out of that rink just, just you know, going, that's the best sporting event I've seen in 10 years. So I think that'll have a big impact. So I think we're in pretty good shape here.